It's TV school time. W-O-I-T-V, in association with the Iowa State Teachers College, presents another program in the Iowa TV School Time Series, Landmarks in Iowa History. Today, instructors Herb Hake and Irving Hart are visiting the site of the Spirit Lake Massacre, so we take you now to the Iowa Great Lakes and Herb Hake. Boys and girls, it's another beautiful day to take pictures, isn't it? And today, we're going to take some pictures of this gardener cabin. You see it here in the background? This is the only cabin that is left after the Spirit Lake Massacre. And as the announcer said, we are in the Great Lakes region today, the Great Lakes region of Iowa. Now, it, this is called the Spirit Lake Massacre, but this particular cabin in which the Gardner family lived, is located on Pillsbury Point on West Okoboji. Now you'll say, what does that have to do with Spirit Lake? Spirit Lake is another lake. Well, all of these lakes at one time were called the Spirit Lakes because the Indians were very superstitious about these lakes. They thought the great spirits of the Indian people lived in these lakes. And so this was sacred ground. You remember in the first program in the Landmark series, I said something about the Indians going to the Pipestone Quarry in Pipestone, Minnesota to get the material for their peace pipes. And they also thought the Pipestone Quarry was sacred ground. The Indians had several places which they considered to be sacred. The Pipestone Quarry in Pipestone, Minnesota, and the Spirit Lake region in which you see this Gardner cabin. A little bit later on, Mr. Hart is going to tell you the story of the massacre and tell you about the cabins that were involved in this Spirit Lake massacre in addition to the Gardner cabin. But right now, I'd like to have you go with me as we look around this particular cabin and see the monument which was put up for the people who were massacred in the Spirit Lake massacre. And I want you to see how this particular cabin and the monument are all hemmed in by tourist cabins, places where they sell live bait, motels, things of that sort. So that when you go up to the Great Lakes region, and to West Okoboji in particular, you'll be able to find this particular cabin. There are no signs anywhere that tell you where it is, but if you look around in West Okoboji, you'll find the cabin and the monument. So come up a little closer and look through this viewfinder, <coughs> this one right here, you know how we do that. Look over my shoulder and we'll take some pictures of the scene of the Spirit Lake Massacre. All right, here we go. Here is the cabin. You see it has a sort of a, a shelter built around it. If you go up closer to it, you'll see that there's a log cabin under it. The shelter was made so that it would be possible for the cabin to be preserved. Now let's move over a little bit toward the side and we'll see the monument. This particular monument is very close to the Gardner cabin. It was erected by order of the 25th General Assembly of the State of Iowa in 1894. You see the monument itself is made of alternate blocks of rough and polished Minnesota granite. And at the top it has an arrowhead shaped stone pointing skyward in memory of the defenseless settlers who were killed in this particular massacre. The members of the assembly, the 25th General Assembly, were in many cases members of the relief party from Fort Dodge and Webster City that came to this region to try to rescue the white settlers who were being menaced by the Indians. See that sign in the foreground that says Okoboji Protective Association. People of Okoboji have had to, 
to take this land and see that it is protected. They keep it up. This is not kept up by the state of Iowa. It is kept up by the Okoboji people themselves. But all around it, you can see these cabins that have fenced in the cabin and the monument. There are cabins for people who go up to the lakes to fish, places where they sell live bait, places where they sell hot dogs, all kinds of places for the tourists. And that's why it makes it very hard to find this particular cabin if you go up to the Great Lakes region. Here is the place where the survivors of the massacre were buried. Here is where Abby Gardner and her two sons are buried. And I'll show you another picture of that a little bit later on. Well, that gives you some kind of an idea about the scene of the Spirit Lake Massacre. Now, as I say, there is quite a story about this Spirit Lake Massacre, and I'd like to have Mr. Hart tell you that story, because he's a much better historian than I am. And for the purposes of telling the story, we'll get out this easel again. We used this last week, you remember, and somebody said, how's it happen that you carry an easel around with you in the station wagon? Well, of course, boys and girls, you know why easels are used, don't you? Easels are used by people who want to make sketches. And many times when I go out to these landmarks areas, I like to make sketches of the places that I see. And I keep this easel in the back of the station wagon so that we can make sketches as we go along. But this morning, we're going to use it for maps. So here you are, Mr. Hart. Will you tell the boys and girls now the story of the Spirit Lake Massacre? Uh, last week, uh, we were at a manor down here uh, on the Iowa River. And this week, we we're going to make a long journey, a long journey in time and in space. We're going to go clear across the state to the northwest here to the very uh, Minnesota border where these Spirit Lakes, or as we call them now, Spirit Lake and East and West Okaboji are located. Uh, here, the uh, Gardner family located in 1856. The father and mother, a grown daughter and her husband and little boy, and uh, a daughter, Abby, 14 years old, and a younger uh, boy of the family. Uh, they came out here in the summer of 1856 and located the, a, a claim on the... Uh, as Mr. Hake has told us, on the shores of West Okaboji, down here on the south, uh, the very south side. Uh, it was uh, rather late in the summer, but they had time, Mr. Gardner and his son-in-law, Luce, to uh, build a log cabin, the one you see in the background here. And before winter came, uh, they had uh, four walls and a, a good big fireplace, plenty of fuel, and enough food to carry them through the winter, although there was no surplus of that. The winter of 1856 and 57 was a very hard winter. It was bitterly cold and there was lots of snow. But this, these settlers in the Gardner cabin and other cabins around the lake uh, lived with fair degree of comfort. But that was not true of the Indians. The Sioux Indians who lived uh, in, up here in northwest Iowa and over in uh, the borders of Minnesota and Dakota uh, suffered terribly during that winter. Uh, they came to be very hungry Indians, and somebody has said that hungry Indians are likely to be bad Indians. Well, I don't know that that is always true, but certainly it was true with regard to some of these Sioux Indians in this case. A little band uh, of uh, 15 or 20 uh, warriors under the leadership of a big, uh, ugly-looking Indian named Ink Paduta. Uh, decided that they were going to come down to into Iowa and uh, get some food for themselves and uh, their families. They came down at the end of the winter of 1856 and 57, and early in March they showed up here in the vicinity of the Spirit Lakes. Uh, Mr. G Mr. Gardner had been planning to go down to Fort Dodge to uh, bring back some additional supplies to carry them through until they could raise their crops. But on the morning of March 7th, the very day he was going to leave, a bunch of Indians showed up. The gardeners were at breakfast, and the, an Indian opened the door and walked in and said he wanted some breakfast. They told him to sit down with them, started to serve him when the door opened again, and a bunch of six or eight other big Indian uh, warriors came in. 
they immediately began demanding more more food. And uh, one of them said they wanted powder and uh, shot and uh, caps. Uh, Mr. Gardner reached for a box of caps and was opening it to give them some caps when one of the Indians grabbed the whole box and took it away from him. Uh, there was a, a pretty uh, serious uh, situation developing there, but finally uh, Gardner uh, managed to get the Indians out of the, uh, the cabin and barred the door, and the Indians disappeared. Uh, they talked it over, and uh, the gardener's son-in-law, Mr. Luce, said he thought he ought to go and warn some of the settler, other settlers. Uh, so he started out. Uh, just a few minutes after he left, uh, they heard some, uh, the sound of uh, some guns uh, being shot off. And, of course, uh, his young wife and his mother were very much worried that uh, Mrs. Luce and her mother, Mrs. Gardner. But Mr. Gardner said he didn't think that anything uh, serious could have happened. And uh, they waited there during the day. Of course, Mr. Gardner gave up his plans of going to Fort Dodge. Toward evening, the Indians came back, pushed their way into the cabin, and again demanded uh, food. As Mr. Gardner turned to go to the flour barrel to scrape the very bottom of the flour barrel and share what little they had with them, one of the Indians raised his musket and shot him dead. And there, uh, then there began uh, just a ruthless massacre. Mrs. Gardner and Mrs. Luce were dragged out uh, from the cabin, uh, were uh, killed and scalped. Uh, the two little boys, uh, the little Luce child and the little Gardner boy, were both uh, uh, killed. And Abby, the 14-year-old daughter, alone was saved. She was taken captive and carried, uh, dragged with the Indians to their camp. In the meantime, uh, the same kind of thing had been happening over here at the Maddox. Uh, and uh, the Thatcher cabin, and uh, uh, the up, up here at the Granger cabin. Uh, the, at the, and when the night came of this uh, first day of this terrible massacre, 20 people, men, women, and children, had been killed. And Abby Gardner, uh, this 14-year-old girl, and two other, uh, three other women who had been captured uh, a Mrs. Uh, Thatcher, a Mrs. Marble, and a Mrs. Noble. All these four, these four women uh, sat there uh, bound uh, in the uh, Indian teepees and heard the sound of the uh, terrible scout dance outside. Uh, Mr. Hart, how long were these women in captivity? How long were they held by the Indians? They were captured on the 7th of March. And uh, they were, uh, two of the women, uh, Mrs. Uh, Noble and Mrs. Thatcher, were killed on the march with the uh, Indians back up to their homes in South Dakota, what is now South Dakota. Mrs. Marble was uh, ransomed uh, in uh, early June, and uh, Abby Gardner later in June, and uh, was allowed eventually to return to her friends here in Iowa. All right, now... Boys and girls, you may think that Abby Gardner, when she was ransomed and came back to Iowa, immediately went back to this particular cabin where the massacre occurred. This, this cabin, the Gardner cabin, was not burned. Many of the other cabins were burned to the ground, but this one was not. Well, you say, why didn't she go back to that cabin? Because in the meantime, some other people had taken over the cabin and had thought to themselves, well, here's a ready-made cabin for us to live in. We'll just take over. So when Abby Gardner came back to the cabin, she found it occupied by other people who said that they were living there now and that, they, that Abby couldn't have her cabin back. So for a while, Abby Gardner lived with friends in Hampton, Iowa. And it was here in 1857 that she met a man named Sharp, whom she married. So for a while, the Sharp family, and they had two boys, lived elsewhere in Iowa until in 1891, Abby Gardner Sharp was able to buy the old homestead again. She had written in the meantime a book about this Spirit Lake massacre, and the profits that she made from the sale of that book enabled her to buy the old homestead back again. So from 1891 until 1921, when she died, she lived in this original home of the gardeners. 
And there are many people in Iowa today who remember meeting Abby Gardner Sharp in the cabin and listening to her tell the story of the massacre and showing the souvenirs of her captivity. And when I was up there this summer, I took some pictures of the inside of the Gardner cabin, and I thought perhaps you'd like to see those. Here they are. This is one wall of the inside of the Gardner cabin. Here you see a fence post. Of course, that wasn't kept in the cabin originally, but this is one of the fence posts that was made by Abby Gardner's father. This was the kind used for rail fences. You see these holes in here? The rails would go through those particular holes. They made a very good fence. Here are some snowshoes that were used up in that region so that the people could get around in the deep snows. Here is an oil painting, which is in pretty bad condition now. Paint is scaling off. But it shows one of the cabins being burned to the ground by Ink Paduta and his warriors. These teepees in the foreground here were the, the temporary homes of Ink Paduta and his men. Here is another inside view of the cabin. This glass case here contains many things that were used by Abby Gardner during the time that she lived in the cabin after she returned from captivity. This little case here contains some baby shoes that were found in front of the cabin after the massacre. And there are other things in here. Here is the family Bible. And there are things arranged on the shelves. Here is a, a thing that has Bible verses on it. The Gardner family was very religious. And these Bible verses were kept hanging on the wall to remind the members of the family of their religion. <clears throat> Here's another corner of the Gardner cabin showing many of the things that Abby Gardner brought back with her. You can't see this very well, but this is the spoon that was used by Abby Gardner during the time she was a captive. And the Indians gave her this, and she used that to eat her food. Here's a bowl. There are various types of Indian implements lying around, the moccasins that were worn by Abby Gardner. Here is a hickory broom that Abby Gardner used in the cabin and other mementos of her life in the Spirit Lake region. This is the bed upstairs in the cabin. It's a two-story cabin. Of course, this is little more than an attic. But this is the bed that Abby Gardner used after she bought the cabin back again and lived in it for the last 30 years of her life. This is quite a, a dark room. And you can see the rough logs here and the rough plaster on the inside. And here is that burial plot that you saw a moment ago when we were making the movie. This pyramid of stones on one side is a marker for six of the survivors, or not six survivors, but six of the people who were killed in the massacre, six members of the Gardner Luce family. This is the headstone for Abby Gardner Sharp. This is the stone of one of her sons. This is the stone for another son. And here is a bench back here. And there is an inscription on the back of the bench, an inscription which says, Abby Gail Gardner Sharp, orphaned and enslaved by the hostile Sioux, she lived to embrace in Christian benevolence the American Indian and all mankind. Now, I think it is interesting to note that in later years, Abby Gardner became the friend of the Indians and some of the people who participated in the raid became Christians, and uh, she became their friend, and they came to see her. Notice back here one of the cabins. This one is called Pleasant View, which seems like an odd name to give a cabin that looks over a burial plot like this. Makes you wonder about the sense of humor that some people have. Well, that gives you some idea about the, about the area in the neighborhood of the cabin. Now, boys and girls, since this is the last program that we're going to have about Indians, I thought perhaps it might be interesting for you to know where the Indians lived in Iowa. That is, the Sioux Indians were the ones who were responsible for this massacre. And a little bit earlier in the series, we talked about the Sacs and the Fox Indians, about the friendly Indians who met Marquette and Joliet, as they came down the Mississippi River. So in this last program concerned with Indians, 
I'd like to ask Mr. Hart to tell you something about where the various Indian tribes lived in Iowa. Would you do that, Mr. Hart, referring to this map here of the Indian populations? Uh, the Indians uh, with whom Marquette and Joliet came in contact down here near the mouth of the Iowa River uh, were probably Iowas who moved westward after that and settled and lived for many years in the Des Moines Valley. This is the, uh, the Des Moines River. This, by the way, is the raccoon. Uh, then the Saxon foxes moved in, and when the white men came to settle Iowa, they, they found this area to the west of the Mississippi River occupied by the Saxon foxes. Uh, the Kettle Chief, whom we talked about in that story of uh, Julian Dubuque, was a member of the Fox tribe. Uh, to the uh, north of that area, there came to be what was called a neutral ground, which was set aside by the United States government uh, to keep the, uh, the warring Saxon foxes on the one side and the Sioux on the other from coming into conflict. Uh, into this neutral ground here, later, uh, a Wisconsin tribe called the Winnebago's were moved. They stayed there only a comparatively short time and were moved out shortly after Iowa became a state. Down in the southwestern part of the state, a group of Indians lived who were called the Potawatomis, and they have given their name to an Iowa county, the county in which Council Bluffs is at the present time. But the greater part of all of this western Iowa and all of this northwestern part had been Sioux hunting ground. And although the Sioux had by treaty given up their claims to this land in Iowa, the last treaty was made in 1851, they continued to come back to hunt and fish there. And it was uh, a band of Sioux, as we have said, uh, which came down into uh, northwestern Iowa in 1857, the winter of 56 and 57, and perpetrated uh, that terrible massacre at Spirit Lake. Well, there are some Indians still living in Iowa, aren't there, Mr. Hart? Where are they located? There's a, a little band of Indians, they call the Meskwaki Indians, who are of the Fox tribe, and they're located down on the Iowa River, just west of the uh, city of Tama. It's called the Tama Reservation, or the Meskwaki Reservation. The Meskwaki is the name of a small group of the, uh, the Fox Indians. Uh, they were moved out uh, of Iowa to Kansas uh, in the uh, middle 40s, 1840s, but they didn't like it down there, and a few of them straggled back and found a place here on the Iowa River and they, where they, uh, their old home had, had been, they found there was 80 acres there for sale, and they tried to buy it. And then they found that they couldn't buy land because uh, they were considered by the government to be uh, just like children. So a group of them went down to Iowa City, which was then still the capital of Iowa, and got uh, Governor uh, Grimes to buy the land for them. And so they settled there, and they now have some 3,200 acres. All right, thank you, Mr. Hart. Now we have a little time left, and I'd like to show the boys and girls, after I get this easel moved out of the way, I'd like to show the boys and girls some of the things used by the Indians at about the time of the Spirit Lake Massacre. Here is a flintlock gun. This is called a flintlock because a piece of flint is attached to the hammer, and it strikes a spark on the steel here, and the spark flies into this powder pan right here and that sets off the the charge now if you look very closely you may be able to see a spark from this hammer as I pull the trigger see if you can see the spark watch closely now the spark will be right along in here somewhere did you see a spark I could barely see it from where I was standing but sometimes it sparks good this is the type of spark or the type of flintlock gun used by the Indians in their time of enlightenment earlier in the 19th century. Here is a typical war club. You see there's a stone up here held in place by a thong and the, the stone itself could inflict quite a, quite a blow upon the head and could crush the skull. This has a springy sort of a handle I have to be very careful about swinging this so that I don't crush my own skull. Here is another type of war club. You see the stone in this case is encased in a rawhide sleeve or pocket. 
and then it swings like this. And notice on the bottom here, there is some horse's hair, ink paduta, I suppose, used human hair on his. But you see, you can get quite a, quite a swing with this particular war club, like that. Almost missed my own hand, didn't I? Here is a typical tomahawk. This is made of iron. This is the kind that was used by the Indians as a result of their trading with the white men. And of course, the Indians used it on the white men in their turn. And here is a typical bowl used by the Indians for grinding their food. So you can see that there are some things which the Indians still use which went all the way back to the early days. Now there is just a little time left, boys and girls, so I'd like to tell you about the kind of homes in which the Indians lived. The Sioux lived in a, in a house like this. This is what is known as a teepee. There was a, a place here for a smoke hole. And then there was a hole here in the front through which people could crawl to get inside the teepee. And this was held in place with wooden pins. That's a teepee. Not to be confused with a toupee. A toupee is something else, boys and girls. A toupee is something that is put on the head as a kind of a covering. One way you can remember this is by remembering that story that Bennett Cerf tells about the man who set fire to his toupee so he could keep his wig warm. You see? That's the way you can remember these things. Now, let me show you the kind of a home used by the other Indians. This is the kind used by the Sioux so that they could travel quickly. They could take this down very quickly. The other Indians, the people who settled permanently in a certain area, used what is called a wiki up. They bent a sapling around this way. And then they used elm bark or something like that to cover the, the semicircular shape of the hut. And that is known as a wikiup or a wigwam. That is a wigwam. A teepee is one of the other kind. Well, boys and girls, I wanted to shade that a little more, but I see our time is just about up, and I want to tell you about where we're going next week. Next week, we are going to visit the Little Brown Church in the Vale. You've heard about that many times, I'm sure. And next week, we are going to visit that famous church. So I hope you'll all be back next week when Mr. Hart and I go to Nashua or to the old village of Bradford and see and visit and hear the old song which made the church famous. The Little Brown Church in the Vale next week. Until then, goodbye. <laughs> Instructors Herb Haig and Irving Hart will visit the Little Brown Church. Landmarks in Iowa history is brought to you as a part of Iowa TV school time by WOI TV in association with the Iowa State Teachers College. Iowa TV school time is presented daily Monday through Friday by the Iowa Joint Committee on Educational Television. Technical director is Vern Casper. Director for WOI-TV, Bob Morrison.